Welcome to the Bright Vibe Podcast. At Bright Vibe, we believe everyone deserves to be happy. But in today's world, everywhere you turn, there is division and negativity. At Bright Vibe, we have created a global movement to bring 8 million people together who are inspired to live bright, live bold, and share bright vibes. Alone, it can be hard to change, but together we can change the world. Welcome to the Bright Vibe Podcast. Emily Balchettis, welcome to the show today. Hi. Yeah, so happy to have you on. So you're an author, you're a social psychologist. I think you you spent some time just up the street from me in Nebraska, I saw. Mm-hmm. Is that is that mm-hmm. accurate? So you know what cold is. I do. I know what ice and freezing <laughs> freezing winds are like on the skin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And now and you currently reside in New York and you're a professor at NYU, is that right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Perfect. Yes. I love all that. And you study kind of, you have a book out called Clear, Closer, Better, How Successful People See the World. And it ref, you know references from a visual perspective. And you also talk about kind of the habits of successful people. And so we want to get into all those fun things today. And so what does the title allude to when we hear Clear, Closer, Better? Well, we're really talking about changing the way that we see the world, but by taking advantage of the power of sight. So, you know, if we, it's like a superpower that we have. Vision Mm -hmm. is, you know, one of the most important and prioritized senses. There's more neurological real estate taken up by our sense of vision than like Mm -hmm. any other way that we get information into our system. So that's why I think of it as like, you know, this untapped power, this untapped potential we have for finding new ways forward, for trying out different strategies than maybe the ones that aren't working for us before. So if we sort of uh, accept, like I have, Mm -hmm. that that vision is special and something that we have control over, then we can see our world in ways that are quite different than maybe we have before. We can see it clearer. We can see things that are closer, our goals as closer, and maybe that will help us more as we move forward. And so, so how do we shift our vision then? Well, we can tell ourselves, look left, look right, right? We all know that we can do that. What I think is interesting is how many visual experiences or the different ways that we get visual experiences that, that we aren't in control of and that we don't even realize because, Mm -hmm. you know, you can think about what we smell, what we taste, what we feel, what we hear. We get lots of opportunities to learn that we've gotten that wrong. You know, our spouse will tell us, oh, you didn't understand me. You didn't hear me right. I get that Mm -hmm. one a lot. Or you're out at a great restaurant, you're tasting mm-hmm. something delicious, you're trying to figure out, oh, what are those spices in there? Mm-hmm. And that's a game. It's a fun game because we know that we're not very good at that. We feel something beautiful and we look at the tag to figure out what is that fabric, right? Mm-hmm. So we know that there is a fall- there's a fallibility, like that we're getting some parts of those experience wrong, but like almost never does that happen with our, our sense of vision. It's like, I know I am looking at you, Matt, and... I'm, I am confident that you're not all of a sudden going to turn into my mother that like, Oh, I've gotten it wrong all along. I thought I was talking to Matt, but right. fact, no, it's been my mom. Like that right. doesn't happen. Right. So we don't get that experience to teach us that there are other ways that we can see things out there that maybe our experience is the wrong one. And that's why visual illusions are fun. Like if you just mm. Google them on YouTube, right? There are mm. so many and you can really get sucked down a rabbit hole there because it defies our expectations about how our visual brain works. Your original question was, but well, how do we, how how do we, we see we, things differently? Yeah, yeah. how can we th- see things differently? Or how, how are you talking about when you say shift our vision or, you know, as you talk about clarity or see things differently, what does that mean, I guess, exactly? How are we seeing things different? Like to your point, if I see an apple and it's an apple, I don't think that's what we're talking about here, but uh, you know, mm-hmm. this is an apple. I recognize an apple. I can say, okay, visually that's an apple. That's, I don't mm-hmm. think what we're talking about. We're talking about a broader sense of vision, I'm assuming. Here. Well, yeah. I mean, in uh, some of the experiments that we've done in my, uh-huh. in my behavioral science lab actually have done things like that. You think you're looking at a horse, but it's actually a seal. So uh, like, those are fun studies right. to conduct and to talk about and for people to experience because it's so surprising. And I think, oh, mm-hmm. that couldn't possibly happen. So there is some scientific mm-hmm. precedent that we can really get things wrong. But I think one that might land with people a little bit better is like, you know, think about driving. 
Mm -hmm. And especially if you're in, a, in an urban area, and especially if you happen to be listening to this in London, and you've ever had the chance to drive in London, it is crazy, right? There are so <laughs> many, there's so many cars, there's so many intersections mm -hmm. that weave in, mm -hmm. nothing is at straight angles, like it was in Nebraska, where we grew up, well, where <laughs> right. I grew up, and then from the yes. Midwest, right? But beyond that, then there's people that are crossing, and then there's bicyclists. And that's the mm -hmm. problem in London, is that there's, the traffic is crazy, there's pedestrians to look out for, but there's bikes as well. And they have their mm -hmm. own lanes, traffic lanes that you need to be on guard for. So the number of fatalities actually in London from bicycling, from, from bicyclists, bicyclist fatalities from car accidents is tremendous. And it's something mm -hmm. that has, you know, is, is a public health issue that's been taken really seriously there. Mm -hmm. When they've interviewed the, the drivers, the car drivers who have hit bicyclists, the most commonly offered answers, I just didn't see them. See them, right. Yeah. Right. Okay, so are they all lying? No, they're not lying, right? This is an awful moment in their life. Nobody right, wants of course. to hit yes. a bicyclist. Right. And they didn't all like, you know, get together and like, you know, form a union and decide this will be the party line. We hit somebody and hurt somebody. Then like, this is what we're all going to say. No, it's because that is genuinely true. They didn't see them. To an outsider, that might seem like crazy. What do you mean you didn't see them? They're right there. They're on a bike. They're like higher than normal. They're, you know, like the bike was really big or it was brightly colored or they were wearing neon or something. And I think that we can all understand that that happens. Mm -hmm. You're not discounting that that happens, but the answer is why? And why are they legitimately telling the truth? I really didn't see them. I didn't see that person. Because what we're thinking about affects what we see. Mm -hmm. So what is going on in our brain? We're thinking about cars. We're trying to navigate traffic. We're not thinking about bicyclists. They're not on the forefront of our mind in the same way when we're driving a car as other cars are. Mm -hmm. And so because we're really on guard for looking for other cars and how are other cars moving around us, that's basically like all that we can see. And we sort of grow blind to anything that doesn't fit that available cognitive content. So that I think is just, you know, one il illustration, one sort of anecdote that I think sets the stage for how like we might not all be seeing all that's really there. And then if we accept that, it's like, well, what, what can we do then? How can we see mm -hmm. more? And what happens if I don't see it all? What happens if I can teach myself to see something that I might not otherwise see? And when you start playing with those ideas, you can see how it relates to so much more than just bicyclist fatalities in London. Mm -hmm. And how does that lead to success, I guess? Because it says how successful, so, so let's talk about, because that's right in the title, that's an easy one for me, of how successful people see the world. So how are, what's the contrast between, I guess, non-successful people is, I'm presupposing that that says is basically how do common people, if we want to say it that way, but how do, how, what makes successful people see things differently or how do they see things differently? Yeah, I, I totally get what you're asking about. And I'll just put a little caveat before I answer the question, which is I'm not trying to like have this be prescriptive or diagnostic right. of like, right. you are successful, you're not, you right. can be, you <laughs> yes. can't. Like, I don't mean it like that, <laughs> right. but yeah, yeah. that it increases the odds of success mm -hmm. that, you know, if we, if we accept that we have this superpower that we haven't fully taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And, and engage with this, like these different learning tools and scenarios, and just think a bit more conscientiously about what we're doing with how we construct our visual world, then we can increase the odds of success at whatever it is that we're interested in taking on. It, mm -hmm. you know, it can be about being a safer driver, or it can be about having healthier relationships with people. It can be about having healthier bodies, eating better food, exercising more, whatever, you know, our financial health, there's, there's lots of different goals that we have mm -hmm. that we, that we struggle with uh, for, for many different understandable reasons. And we might be up against those same obstacles many times. And the strategies that we're using just aren't serving us. They're not, they're not helping us get through these repeated challenges that we're facing. So we can teach ourselves to see the world in different ways and maybe open up roadblocks or pass through obstacles that have stymied us before mm -hmm. and increase the odds of success. Okay. And when you say teach ourselves, is that through an act of like a physical act of observation? Because as you're saying this, for me, it's like, it sounds like what I would say being present, being present in the moment, you see things differently, right? So if I'm on my, you know, if, uh, you know, if I'm with my kids, and I've got my cell phone, you know, and I'm looking at something on my cell phone, and my kids are there, I'm only taking in maybe 10 or 20% of what they're actually doing visually, because I'm distracting myself, right? And so right. Then, yeah. then if I set the cell phone down, and I actually look at my kids, I can tell that they can tell that I'm looking and then there's this deeper sense of 
a connection where I'm truly appreciating my child for playing or talking to me. I, I love nothing more than seeing my three-year-old little daughter just move her little lips and her high-pitched little voice. There's just something so very cute and just like watching a baby animal almost, right? It's almost like I'm in nature. And I'm, <laughs> she is a baby what? animal, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And she's, <laughs> a, and she's using her little, and it just like, that's just terribly, what I say all the time to her, I'm just like, you're terribly cute. But so is that what we're talking about? Just being more present physically? And I mean, literally using our sense of vision to be more present? That's part of it. And I totally yeah. resonate with your story. I have a six and a half year old and a, and a 10 month old. Uh -huh. And um, now twice I have learned they pick up on what we're looking mm -hmm. at really fast, yes, <laughs> shared visual attention. And when you read more into the literature, that's very adaptive. That's how they mm -hmm. learn is by looking mm -hmm. at what, what are you looking at? And they're learning mm -hmm. what matters. And so I learned the hard way. I don't want to teach my children that mm -hmm. the phone matters. Right. So, but yeah, but it's a constant struggle because we're all multitasking. And that's one thing that you're talking about. What if we were move the multitasking and we, mm -hmm. and we focus, what are the consequences of that? So I totally resonate with your experience and I've had that too, of like, you know what? I actually enjoy my life more when I am, especially with the children, when I am more mindful and present mm -hmm. and, and, and not multitasking, we'll come back to your big question, but let me just mm -hmm. say that like mm -hmm. multi in that context, we might feel for ourselves that multitasking isn't getting the job done. I, I know that I am not a good researcher and parent simultaneously. Right. My children don't care about multiple regressions <laughs> or, you know, predictive validity. Um, mm. and even if I do, so like the, that doesn't work for me, but, um, multitasking actually is a tool. It's not always bad, right? Mm. So we can, that example makes it seem like, okay, if we were more mindfully present on something singular in the moment, we might improve our efficiency or our experience there. And yeah, that's true. But multitasking actually can be helpful because of increased cognitive demands are stimulating, they're exciting, they, they release like a cascade of hormones that are markers of stress. But what stress does is engage our higher order cognitive processing areas and our learning and memory systems. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when we are like, bored, what we do need to do <laughs> is multitask, right? When something at, at work is just like, oh my God, I do this all the time, right? But I still have mm. to do this today. Finding ways to multitask by playing music or like, mm. or anything, or mm. you're switching between tasks can be kind of a form of stress that actually is beneficial and evidence suggests that helps people perform their jobs better, becoming more efficient at, without the cost of making more mistakes. So that's just my little aside of like, mm -hmm. you know, let's just play devil's advocate with each idea that comes out there. We might realize mm -hmm. when we dig into the science of it, that mm -hmm. um, the story isn't so simple and multitasking does get a bad rap, especially in yes. my life. I don't like it, but right. it's a tool to know how to deploy strategically. Fair when enough. we understand yeah. more of what it can do, then we can use it to our advantage when we need it. And so if that makes sense, then that like, well, multitasking, let's just, you know, let's not just put like a... A, a red A on it, a scarlet letter A and say it's bad, right? Mm -hmm. But let's think of it as a tool. And if I can use this tool in the right moments, then I can reap its benefits. The same thing with our visual experience. So yes, being mindful with your child in that moment has given you a greater focus of what it is that they're doing and their cute mm -hmm. little smiles and their cute cues, cues and, mm -hmm. and words or whatever it is that they're doing. Um, but sometimes some of what we need to do is see multiple possibilities that our one singular focus actually isn't doing us a great service, that this is an opportunity where we need to be brainstorming and taking input from, from all facets of our life. And a third case is when we actually need to, we need to put on blinders for things. When we have temptations that we don't want to be pulling at us and that we don't want to succumb to, mm -hmm. actually being able to tune out mm -hmm. is what is going to increase the odds of success. So we can think about the different situations are, that we're in. Is this one where I know that I benefit more by being singularly focused to take in more of, mm -hmm. of this experience, right. a shared experience with my child and tune out what's over here to focus on what's right here? Or is it one where I need to expand my understanding of all the possibilities around me because that's what the situation requires for success? Or is it one where I need to be tuning stuff out? So we need to be a bit diagnostic with like, what are the circumstances that we're in and what's going to be the best tact for getting the job done? You know, and when you're, and as I'm listening to you, and my new phrase that I picked up yesterday, listen to learn. That was my new phrase from my podcast mm -hmm. yesterday, listen to learn. I was like, I've never thought about it that way. But as I'm learning, you know, I'm thinking about uh, just some experience 
experiments. I'm my own guinea pig. I think most of us are, but over the last several years, just with uh, social media, with the media in general, with uh, my external environment is how am I, to your point, almost dieting or how am I bl putting blinders on to some things and opening my eyes to other things on, in an intentional way. And I know that I've done this specifically with social media. So with mm -hmm. social media, I really, I like things, uh, you know, I go and intentionally like groups or things that I'm interested in, like outdoor hiking. So boom like that one, right? Outdoor waterfalls, boom, like that one. So, so things that, I, that I want to be, see more of and drawn into, mm -hmm. and then conversely, anything that I see, you know, from somebody who's on my feed, that's like negative in, in a way, or, or just engaging in just crap, basically. Right. I just mm -hmm. unfollow them. Right. Because I'm like, mm -hmm. well, I just don't want that in my, where before it was just like streaming, whatever. And I'd get sucked into this or sucked into that. And it's like, I finally, I just stopped. And I was like, how often am I just getting sucked into stuff that matters? Not one iota. And is it, if it's not adding any value or if I'm not going to do anything about it, that was my other, mm -hmm. that was kind of my litmus test. It was kind of like, am I going to do anything about this? Like really other than yeah. complain, because if I'm only complaining that I'm doing myself and everyone else a disservice, if I'm actually going to do so, if I'm going to donate money or if I'm going to go volunteer time, then that's a valuable thing. But if I'm not going to do anything, then stop playing with it. Right. It's just like a, it's, I don't know. It's like a, a pig in a pen that's all muddy. It's like, if you don't want to get muddy, stop playing with the pig. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, right. sorry, I'm, get, yeah. I'm trying to do farm references. You know, you're from Nebraska. So I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to do some type of farm reference. Well, as an aside, I didn't yes. grow up on a farm. I did oh, visit okay. one in college. Um, <laughs> but I do remember in kindergarten yes. when we, you know, there was an incubator. They brought in an incubator and like, uh -huh. I don't know, a dozen chicken eggs yeah. or something like that. And and when I was five, then we got to watch them hatch in our yeah. classroom. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. My mom did not grow up on a farm, but was a, was definitely a hippie. And I was like, oh my God, mom, we just got, got to watch these chickens hatch. I want chickens, as every five-year-old says about the thing that just caught their interest. Yes, and yes. she said, okay. So we got, <laughs> we got a it. cardboard, we got a cardboard box and- uh -huh and a heat lamp and she got a bunch of fertilized <laughs> eggs I guess and uh and we watched them hatch in my bedroom and it was you know like the carpet remnants of the 70s it was green uh -huh. shag and yes and as a I had that old, I thought yeah. It, yeah right I thought it was yeah. grass and so yeah, they hatched in my bedroom I let them run around the grass of course they pooped and peed all over my bedroom floor <laughs> those chickens lasted in my room for I don't even know a day or something like that before my mom <laughs> took them to the farm and I believe she took them to the farm there, there was one nearby she could have taken them to uh and we got new carpet so anyway, that is my farm background. Okay. <laughs> so I farmed in my bedroom for a couple of days. But what what your story, yeah. like what I think of with your story is with your pig example mm -hmm. is that we're talking about being conscientious constructors of our visual environment, because mm -hmm. we know that like what we're seeing is having a direct effect on our brain and our body and our, mm -hmm. our sense of well-being, how we're spending our time, are we doing something productive? What we're seeing is having that effect. Right. And so you have taken, you've employed strategies then mm -hmm. to be more conscientious about that, about liking or following people, unfollowing people, spending how you engaged in order mm -hmm. to, you know, manipulate or, or play mm -hmm. into the mm -hmm. algorithm to give right. you a better future experience. We can think about that with, uh, you know, we should do that with, with social media and all kinds of media is not let it tell us right. what are you going to get today? If we, if we want to have a better experience in mm -hmm. our life, we can make sure that we don't accept defaults. You know, when we download a new app, there's so many ways to get in touch with people, right? You could call on a phone. If anyone does that anymore, you could text, you could DM, you could right. you know, use WhatsApp. You could like, there's so many different platforms for engaging with people. Mm -hmm. And all of those platforms have defaults in the way that they are set up to keep you engaged with their right. platform. Right? Right. But we can be conscientious about that if we're finding like you know what I just don't have enough time I don't have enough time in my day that is like my chronic running motif in my life I don't have enough time <laughs> then like well what's pulling at our time that we don't want to pull at our time right mm -hmm. and it can be notifications that pop up and say like oh hey you haven't checked in in this you know like do you want to check in at this location or do you want to like here's something that that might be right. like shiny and new come play with me come play with me right. and if you don't want that to happen because you want to engage with all these platforms on your terms then don't let right. it notify you right turn these right. things off and that's one way that we become more conscientious consumers mm -hmm. of 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 media content or things that are trying to pull it pull it at us 
we can think about it, you know, in other contexts also think about dieting. If that's something mm-hmm. that is of interest, like what are we eating? Well, where do people go wrong? Um, I mean, lots of ways we struggle, but one of those is sort of mindless snacking. Like that's mm-hmm. one problem, right? So think about what that's like when you, it's like three o'clock, you're hungry, you're tired. What are you going to do about it? You should, you know, at three o'clock, you probably should go for a walk, but you're kind of too tired or you don't have the time. And so you're just like, I'm going to go get like a coffee. I'm going to make myself a coffee or I'm going to go get a snack. And that's going to, that's going to waken me up again. And so it's like, your body doesn't really need it. You just think that you want it. And so you're, you like go through and look, you know, look in the pantry or look in the fridge or look in your snack drawer and you, and you are tempted by the things that you see first. Sure. Of course. Um, Yes. Right. So like my, my husband, this is, He's a lovely man. Uh, one, <laughs> uh, no, he only has one annoying thing. It has to do with the fridge, which is we'll, that he We'll does edit not this eat... out if you want to later. If, if it's too dark, we'll just No, no, we'll keep that in. That, no, keep it <laughs> okay, in. Just, okay. If I'm only saying there's one annoying thing, exactly. then like, keep that in. <laughs> so, yeah. So, like, when he only eats the first layer of the fridge, right? So, if they're, oh, yeah. like, leftovers that I know he, like, he needs to eat these things or you whatever. You push them right but, up to the front. <laughs> <laughs> right or if he's left to his own devices and he's feeding the children tonight like I have to put the broccoli right at his eye level in the front row of all the stuff because he doesn't dig to the back right um because like that's enough like oh I see it that's enough I can just take that so we can be more conscientious about how we craft our food environments right so if mm-hmm. we want to cut down on eating snacks then of course like try to not have them in the house in the first place don't don't buy them but maybe you have to buy them because somebody else does the shopping or because someone else really enjoys them in your house then make them harder for you to see. Put them in opaque containers, take them out of their original packaging, put them into something that you can't see through to see what's on the inside and Mm -hmm. you don't see its label that you've associated with like feeling good before. Make it harder for that Mm -hmm. visual spark to like to grab you and then have you grab it. So those are just a couple of suggestions. And there's been some like, you know, cool studies that have been done looking at what happens when you play with people's visual experience of right. food and does it have an effect on people's overall health? The answer is yes. That um, there was a study done with Massachusetts General Hospital Hospital mm-hmm. uh, in the cafeteria. And they uh, they decided to play around with how they stocked the shelves and also how they gave people health information. Of course, like most foods have nutrition labels that- right. A lot of people don't read and a lot Mm -hmm. of people don't understand. And I am certainly, I'm certainly one of those people. I don't read it enough and I don't understand what I'm reading. But if we did, if we read it and understood Mm -hmm. it, we might be able to make more Mm -hmm. informed choices. choices. So they helped by putting colored stickers, red, yellow, and green stickers, like the stop, stop light Mm -hmm. stickers, Mm -hmm. red on the things that people really should not be eating or definitely in moderation, like sugary beverages, Mm -hmm. yellow for things that you should, you should do like, it's okay, but small amounts and green Mm -hmm. is like, yeah, go for it. Right vegetables, right. fruits, you could, yep. yeah, all of those are good. And then they took those green items and put them at people's eye level, put the red mm-hmm. things lower on the shelf and then decide and, and work, we're conscientious about what's closer to the cash register to the checkout. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they looked to see the changes in, in terms of um, what people were eating. And they mm-hmm. found that just by making those, like, like using these visual tricks, it's not like they, they took some items out of rotation. The offering stayed the same. Still there. Right. Yeah, they still were there, but they played with the visuals of it. And they saw that, you know, the amount of red dot things went down that people ate Mm -hmm. in this cafeteria, the green dot things went up and people were more mindful about what they were doing with the yellow dot things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess we could start putting dots on all of our food or something that maybe is more (laughs) scalable for ourselves, which is just to take, think about what we put on the shelves when we come back, like how we put it on our shelves when we come back from the grocery store. And mm-hmm. what do we put in that first level of the fridge, the, the first the first dimension of, of fridge stocking? Yeah, and in our house, we did, you know, my wife did that. She moved like the vegetables and the, you know, the leftovers sometimes, but she moved them up so that we're seeing, you know, she and I are at least seeing those right up front so that we're more conscious of, oh, okay, one, they go bad faster typically. So you want to <laughs> use these things, yeah. but it's more of, oh yeah, that's, that's right there. And we see it. And so we incorporate it into to when we cook and do things like that, you know, and as I'm, as I'm listening, I'm really reflecting back on, you know, designing your visual perspective in all ways, right? Your house, your work, your car. I mean, I am sensitive to, I've learned over the years that I'm sensitive to environments based on, I'm a very visual person, right? So I love mm-hmm. to design. I love to create things usually from development. So usually buildings, but when I do, it's always a lot of visual for me. It's a lot of visual stuff, right? And so, because I, I know I can literally feel 
through sight, I can feel what what's what feels good and what doesn't feel good, basically. And for, I think, a lot of people who aren't uh, aware of it, they're still being affected. They just don't know. It was feng shui, I guess, is what you could call it. But yeah. they're being affected even though they don't know that they're being affected. So visual has a lot. I mean, why do you feel so good when you go on vacation? Right. Because typically people go on vacation to places that are pretty, right, that have (laughs) trees and oceans and mountains and right. And so your your visual perspective is different. I know when I go out in nature, I immediately feel different. Like if I go for a hike in the woods, I immediately feel different than if I'm in my car driving on the highway. I mean, I think everybody (laughs) would. Right. That's a pretty extreme example. But, you know, that's and, and so what are we putting, you know, what are we putting in our visual perspective and designing? You said, you know, said this earlier. It's kind of like designing our visual world. I think the only thing, you know, when I think about the things we can control, we can control where we put our physical bodies, thus our eyes, right? Mm-hmm. And so we can design what we're looking at and seeing on a daily basis, even if it's, I'm sure you've got examples of things we can do. But, but you know, even I remember once I was going through a stage in my life and I just literally ripped pages out of magazines in an office I was in. And I just took the whole wall that I would look at every day and just had pictures of things that I wanted to attract into my life through visual reference. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, and, and people would probably walk in and go, what in the, I mean, they would look at that one. Cause it was just, <laughs> it was literally killer. just, yeah, exactly. Pages yeah. out of magazines, but it was all pretty stuff. Um, yeah. and, but it was like, well, so I, I didn't have to have, I didn't have to have a window with a view of this and this and this, it was more of just kind of reminding myself or, or, you know, when I think of visual stuff for me, there's got to be some tie with emotion, right? Totally. Yeah. One of my favorite art, artists, I could say that about many, I have many favorite artists, but uh-huh. one of them is Richard Serra. I okay. don't know if you know I, his I'm work. I'm not familiar um, with his work. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, he, he does lots of different kinds of art, but like what really gets me is the work that he's done that are these big sculptures, installation pieces made out of, oh, I'm going to get the material wrong, but the same kind of material that makes the hulls of ships, uh-huh. like, like steel, steel, yeah. <laughs> steel yeah. yeah, and very thick, like as mm-hmm. thick as, right, as, as a hull of a ship. Mm-hmm. is and so that's his medium that's what he's working mm-hmm. with he works in like sh- a shipyard mm-hmm. uh, because his pieces are that large there are these enormous enormous pieces that are all like brown rusted beautiful mm-hmm. patterns of rust that are mm-hmm. all over the steel and then he plays with form so and what's amazing too is that you get these things that weigh like hundreds of tons and they might be just balancing on two points of, oh, wow. of this piece, right? Mm-hmm. And it and it's just how does he play with that? And as you know, as a I'm not a sculptor, but mm-hmm. as sculptors do, that is what is one of the many things that's so amazing about their art is like, how can you get all of that marble to balance on just two small feet of mm-hmm. you know of this mm-hmm. person that you've sculpted? Or in this case, like how do you get all of like this hull of a ship to balance just on two points mm-hmm. when you look at it, like I can see light under there, it's not touching the ground. <laughs> So that's one thing is that it's amazing in that sense. But the other one is that like the visual experience of it has a direct impact on your emotions and your psychology. Because another part of the way that he lays out these big sheets or planes of metal is that you can walk through these sculptures. sculptures. Sometimes they're Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. spiral shapes or or these like serpentine figures that have two walls. And what he plays with is like the compression and expansion of the walls as you're going through. Mm -hmm. So you can be walking through these tight spaces, right? Where it's like, oh my God, these things could come crashing down on me. And you have the like, Right, and, and then it opens up again, and you see the sky above you, and then there's the release, right? It's right. This tension and release based on the visual experience. The steel isn't touching you, it, you, you know, it's never right. going to fall over on you, <laughs> right? But your eyes are telling you that, mm-hmm. and you're it's having a direct impact on your emotions. Mm-hmm. And that sounds similar to the basically the vision boards that you were yeah. scrapbooking and putting yeah. on your walls, right? right. Is that mm-hmm. that visual imagery uh, is having an impact on you? A lot of people find that to be motivating to mm-hmm. create visual visuals that reflect a combination of all the things that they want in their life or that they're working mm-hmm. towards or something that inspires them and gives them motivation. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and, and I've thought a lot about vision boards. They mm-hmm. are very effective for helping people to articulate what they want. 
in right. life. It sounds like it, it was for you too. In fact, you know, like like TD Bank uh, recently ish did a survey of a small of 500 small business owners and asked them mm-hmm. like in your business plans, do you use vision boards, some sort of oh, interesting. construction, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. you know, a vision board, yeah, some right. version of that. Maybe it's right. a scrapbook or not, or maybe it's something else to articulate where are you moving in the future using visual iconography. Right. And you know, the vast majority of these small business owners said yes. Yeah, you know, like really? Over, Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna get the numbers quite right, but like two thirds, you know, oh, more wow. than two thirds, three quarters wow. said like, yes, I use this. It's more popular among like millennial generations mm-hmm. and older generations. So there are these caveats, right? Mm-hmm. But like, still, no one is like zero percent. No one, no right. one is like, no, it doesn't work. Right. There isn't a demographic that was like, absolutely not. I don't use it. Mm-hmm. And then, and then why? Why do you use it? Uh, because it. I, most people said that it helps convey a clear sense of where a company is headed. Mm-hmm. So it is something that is used a lot personally and mm-hmm. professionally. Mm-hmm. And it is a good thing for, for figuring out or for articulating where do you want to go. As a motivation researcher, though, I do know that um, if that is where the process of goal goal setting stops, right. then we're in trouble. Right. <laughs> because right. That hasn't set us up for success. That right. isn't going, um, in fact, it actually can in some situations backfire and make us even less likely to mm. do the things that we need to do to get the job done. So some colleagues of mine at New York University studied this. Well, what happens when we, like in a sense, daydream about what it is that we want? How good is it going to be when I get to this mm-hmm. place X? What is that place X? What, am, what is my life going to be like when I hit that? And they spend time sort of daydreaming, fantasizing about what that would be like. In a sense, that's what that's what vision boarding can be if that's where we stop with goal setting is thinking mm-hmm. about that's what I want. This is what it's right. going to be like. This is how I'll look or how, mm-hmm. how I'll, I will feel. And they compared that experience of um, you know daydreaming to thinking about okay, what do I need to do? What might stand in my way? And getting down into like the nitty gritty mm-hmm. yeah, of, tactical. of goal mm-hmm. setting and tactical, yeah. exactly. Yeah, of course. And what they 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 measured something that maybe seems counterintuitive, but they they measured systolic blood pressure. That may not mm. be your first go to, like in this mm-hmm. context, systolic blood pressure. Really, <laughs> it's a top number on your blood pressure reading. Mm-hmm. But behavioral scientists know that it's an indicator of our body's readiness to get up and do something. Mm, okay. So, yeah. So like this has been studied in, uh, and racing horses, you know, that are, that are in mm-hmm. their gates before, well, in their mm-hmm. stalls before the gates open. Right? Mm-hmm. So they're not moving or they're just jostling around, right. but they're certainly not racing. And in anticipation of those gates opening, mm-hmm. systolic blood pressure goes up. Of course. Yes. They're getting ready yeah. to perform. Right? So they're right? getting yeah. ready to perform and it's yeah. systolic blood pressure in particular that is indexing that mobilization, that readiness to do something. And that doing something can be physical, like running for a racing horse, but it can also just be cognitive. Mm. So other scientists have looked at, okay, what is happening as people are like getting ready to do really complicated math problems? Mm -hmm. They're just going to sit there with a piece of paper and a pencil, but their brain is going to have to do something. They're going to have to focus right now. And they see systolic blood pressure going up. Mm -hmm. in those cases, mobilization Mm -hmm. of the Mm -hmm. effort and motivation and energy that you're going to need to do this job. Mm -hmm. So back to that whole like vision boarding daydreaming study, Mm -hmm. what they found was that systolic blood pressure went down for those people that, that simply envisioned what that, Mm -hmm. what that future would be like and feel like Mm -hmm. compared to those that started thinking more tactically. Mm-hmm. You know, still did the fantasizing, but coupled on that tactical thinking. Mm-hmm. So it was almost as if their body was like chilling out before we even, <laughs> even gotten started. Right? It was already on vacation. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. yeah, vicariously like consuming that desired end mm-hmm. state and like, and, like mission accomplished. I know Chill. what it's going to be like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, I guess if that's your goal, then that would be a good thing. <laughs> but, I suppose, yeah. but most right. of us make those vision boards, not just to feel right. good, but to yes. actually meet those goals. Yeah. Right, right. So I, my new favorite question on the podcast is if you had one message to impart to all 8 billion people of us now that are on the face of the earth, just your whatever you would like to impart, what would that be? What would be your kind of, if you had your two, three minutes of time to say, everybody got a recording or the video of it. What what would be your things that you would want us all to know? I mean, I think the big message here is just that we are, we are constantly growing. And once mm. we start putting labels on ourselves of like, oh, 
oh, I'm not a math person or I'm not a leader. Oh, I'm not a business person. Then mm -hmm. we do ourselves a real disservice because that's mm -hmm. just not true. Like none of us were born to do math, to lead or to be in business, mm -hmm. but some people figure it out, right? right. Because we're all capable of learning. Mm -hmm. Once we get older, we, we, you know, some of us tend to think that like, well, that's not possible. You know, I've already mm -hmm. had too long with this body, this mind, this mm -hmm. way of being for me to change. And that's just, that's just not the case. It could be that the tactics we're using are the wrong ones to mm -hmm. work through the obstacles that we're experiencing. And that, you know, maybe we have three or four that we try, but those three or four might be the ones that aren't quite right. right. So I like to think about, you know, what are our possibilities in life? What are we capable of doing? And we need to build out a toolbox that allows us to take on that job. So yes, I might not be, uh, I might not be fiscally minded right now, mm -hmm. but if I try using some other tactic to learn those skills, I bet you that I could make some progress and grow. So yeah. And so that's how I approach thinking about goal setting and what tactics mm -hmm. are available to help increase the odds of success is that, yeah, there's no one go-to strategy. There's no one formula that's going to nail it for everybody. Right. But instead, you know, just like, you know, a carpenter can't build a house if he only had, you know, a toolbox full of hammers mm -hmm. and you need loads of different kinds of tools. And, and so do we, as we try to take on new challenges and, and push through adversity and do things that we haven't done before. So the more that we can learn new skills, then the better the odds that we have the tool that we need when we're up against a new challenge. Hmm. I love it. I love it. And yes, a lifelong learner, right? Just mm -hmm. constantly. Um, and what else, you know, life, life is for learning. I think it's kind of a big school here for us to learn and experience and take that all in. So oh. yes. Well, thank yeah. you. So thank you so much for your time today. Um, you know, certainly I looked it up on Amazon. So I know your books on Amazon and it gets mm -hmm. great reviews, clear, closer, better, how successful people see the world. Um, is there, and I think you're on social media as well. Is there, yeah. you know, if people want to learn more about your research or what you're up to, is there a preferred place that they would go to learn more about Emily? Sure. You can, I mean, I, I try to post lots of content on LinkedIn and I write for psychology today. And then a lot of the research, if you want to get into the weeds of it, is mm -hmm. uh, posted on my own website. So you can just Google my name. Oh, perfect. Well, I love that. So thank you so much for coming on. And as you, you know, get into research and want to share more of that, we'd love to have you come back on the show and share any of the findings you're doing or if you're getting ready to write papers or, or come up with just so you're like, wow, the, a new discovery please let us know and we'll love to come on and talk to you about it. Awesome. Thanks so much. This has been fun. Yes. Well, you have a beautiful day. Thanks. See you later, Matt. Bye. Bye. Thank you for being a part of the Bright Vibe podcast. For more information, go to brightvibe.com. That's B-R-I-T-E, vibe, V-I-B-E.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>